And uh, welcome everybody again. I'm so glad you're here. My name is Dr. Charla Griffey Brown, Professor of Information Systems and Technology Management at the Pepperdine Grazio Business School. And I'm so delighted that everyone is here and able to uh, join us. I'm excited because um, we get to learn from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dan Carlson tonight. And uh, in a minute, I have the privilege of introducing him. But first, I want to remind everybody to keep your um, videos off. And your, um, you should be muted. And that's OK, because I hope you'll have questions. You can ask questions in the chat, and then I will ask them of Lieutenant Carlson. So um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Carl Carlson. Uh, so uh, if you if we can stick to that format, I think that'll just make things easier. We have more people joining us tonight than usual. So I just want to manage our bandwidth and uh, and our time because there's so much that I know we're going to learn together about leadership during a crisis, during disruption, and uh, and the fact that you can learn from great leaders and you can learn from toxic leaders. So I am super excited about uh, about taking this journey with you, Dan. So let me introduce you, um, Dan. Uh, I'm so excited to introduce Dan for so many reasons. Let me tell you a little bit about um, his background. And uh, it really is incredible. I know you are so humble, so uh, this, this might even be a little embarrassing for you, but um, uh, I don't even know where to start. He joined the Army 29 years ago um, in 1990. He started out um, enlisting in the infantry, and his first assignment was as a Ranger in the 2nd uh, Ranger Battalion. He went back to school and graduated from Cal State Long Beach. He became a pilot in the California Army National Guard, and Dan has led four aviation uh, companies and three battalions as a reservist. He served five years at uh, North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD. With, he was a national, uh, that's a national command center that protects the homeland. Uh, he graduated from Ranger School, Command and General Staff College and Joint Staff College. But I am so uh, delighted and honored and proud to say that he is a Pepperdine MBA alumni. He graduated from our um, full employed MBA program and I had the privilege of having uh, Dan as a student. In 2019, he was awarded our uh, uh, most distinguished recognition as a student, the George Award. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about him because He's deployed twice to Iraq as an aviation unit commander. He flies army helicopters and airplanes. He was awarded a bronze star and an air medal for actions in Iraq. He works for the Federal Aviation Administration as a medical analyst. And I have to tell you this, he's famous for saying the 80s called and it wants its leadership style back. So with that as an introduction, I am going to hand it over to you, Dan, and probably about midway through, there's a, there's a point at which we're gonna stop and, and I'll field some questions and then we'll um, uh, finish your story and, uh, and head back. So feel free to share your screen. Okay, thank you, Sharla. Uh, I really enjoyed that introduction. I appreciate you, you're a connector and it's just a neat person to be around. You always have a lot of energy. And I enjoyed your class too when I was there. And so, I'm glad we're still connected. Uh, there's so many talented uh, students as well at Pepperdine. I've met a lot of friends. I see some of the friends that are on tonight. Um, also, uh, I wanted to let everybody know the Pepperdine network is strong. Uh, when I was going through uh, the MBA program, oftentimes we were doing research for projects and I would identify graduates of the program on LinkedIn and I would ask them uh, for a phone call. And most generally, they all picked up. And my commitment to the MBA program is when somebody calls me from Pepperdine, I'm gonna pick up the phone and I'm gonna answer it. And if you've got a question that I can help you with, I'm gonna by God answer it because that's how it works at these institutions, or fine institutions. And uh, Pepperdine has shown a huge commitment to its veterans with the Yellow Ribbon Program. Pepperdine loves its veterans. And so if you are a veteran out there and you're thinking about joining the program, I say just do it. Uh, I had a wonderful experience. Uh, it's a wonderful brand and uh, it's helped me greatly as well as the academic rigor. I've grown uh, a lot from it. And so I'm appreciative of it. 
Uh, thank you all for signing up for this resilience uh, series uh, together. Thank you for listening tonight. Uh, we hope to leave you with some salient points on resilience tonight. Also, uh, we're here for you. We care about you today. Uh, we want you to improve your leadership and help you and show you how to grow through tough times. Uh, it's your growth and development that we're here tonight. Uh, so what I've done yesterday, uh, uh, the way I am, it doesn't really matter anymore. Uh, today is the only day that we're guaranteed. Uh, we don't know how many tomorrows that we have. So all we have is today and the moment that we're in to savor. And uh, with that time, I'm committed to grow and change. And I know so many of the other students that I went with at Pepperdine were committed to that change as well. It was a transformative experience at Pepperdine and it, it helped me out even though I have a lot of leadership experience. Um, I, I learned how to come together as a group and solve uh, some tremendous problems while we were there. And I uh, still have those friendships today and I cherish them. Uh, so yes, um, uh, I am talking about resilience tonight, but I would bet you that I have the same chocolate cravings that you have. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm just a human. And although I've done this uh, reservist role for 26 years, uh, no one year has been the same. They've all been different and each time I've grown. Uh, as reservists, we are citizen soldiers. We go to our normal jobs. Uh, Charla mentioned that I work for the FAA. I'm proud of that. I love our country. I want our country to be strong. And so uh, that's what gets me up out of bed. I want it to be strong for myself and my family, but I also want it to be strong for you and your family. And so uh, we're in this great experience together, this boat called life, and we're in it together. And so if there's some piece of information that I have that I can help others with, that's what I wanna do. So I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen it's going to take me a second to get that set up here. Um, I do have a presentation waiting and I want to uh, go here and hit share and then go to the slide deck. Um, I have this slide deck. Uh, it's called Adapt, Adopt and Evolve. Uh, this is a story about the electronic uh, disruption cycle at war. Um, our military unit, as Charlotte said, we, we, we deployed. Our military unit uh, was called to uh, adapt to a new environment uh, while on the fly, adopt new technologies, and then evolve from that. But um, I want to explain it uh, from a perspective on uh, how we battled through it as a team and uh, give you some personal anecdotes and also tell a story because uh, none of this happens in a laboratory. Uh, life happens to us when we're out doing things. And at some point you have to use all the experiences to make judgments and decisions. And uh, the school time is over and, 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 and life uh, hits you sometimes really hard. Uh, although tonight I'll be talking about military technology, all this military technology uh, that I'm talking about is from open sources. This briefing is unclassified. And all there may be people here who hold beliefs against war. I respect that point of view. Most soldiers don't want war either. Uh, I wanted to just let you know, though, that the military is formed by our Constitution and it's our political leaders that bear that responsibility of taking us into just wars and exiting us out of wars. I'm just here to tell a story that's analogous to life, and it's using this as a vehicle. Uh, so anyway, let's get started, and uh, we'll take you to the next slide here. Yep, one slide too many. So I wanted to talk about uh, uh, skills that are needed in today's age. Uh, a lot of problems don't come to us real tidy, and so uh, the ones that I have listed here, uh, volatile, complex, uncertain, and ambiguous. Uh, and then I list a set of skills that are needed to get through that, those times. So if you're talking about volatile, that means uh, a problem that uh, one bad decision or wrong move or uh, incorrect words uh, can lead to hostility or it can lead to uh, four more problems opening up. That's volatile. Complex is 
no one silver bullet answer is going to solve the complexity of the problem. And oftentimes you may make a choice that's adverse to other parts of the problem that is complexity. Uncertainty uh, means that we don't have enough information to solve the problem entirely. Uh, if you hear a dog, that's my dog in the background, and somebody's getting them really riled up back there. <laughs> uh, so uncertainty is when we just don't have enough information to solve the problem. And uh, that means that we often have to make a decision without all of the information, and that may lead to a better outcome. Ambiguous, of course, means that uh, there is no right answer, there is no wrong answer. It's an obstacle that we need to get through. There's no book about it. And sometimes it's just a shot in the dark. Oftentimes we run into problems like this, they're like black swan problems, but it doesn't have to be that bad. Uh, these are problems that are often tangled in deep uh, personnel issues. So if you're leading people and uh, you know you have to address the situation and uh, it's gonna get volatile in terms of like, uh, people are gonna get turned off by it and uh, you, you think the unit may go south um, or it'll lead people astray or be confusing to others. Uh, it'll lead to all different kinds of feelings. Like those are the kind of things that I'm talking about here. Um, but even though I'm talking about uh, a military unit tonight, I want you to know that uh, this is very synonymous with a corporation. Uh, these problems are people problems and they travel with wherever people go, there are people problems. And usually those are the ones that are the most vexing to solve because they involve people's behaviors, attitudes, adjustments. And you can see from this list, uh, these are the things that are needed when these type of problems hit. Order, calm, rational behavior, communication, focus, uh, direction, and confidence, and personal courage. Uh, I don't know of anyone really that has all of that uh, just tidied up and that they're just a whole complete package. And you really should know that uh, using these uh, facets of your, your personality, uh, they start out really small. They start out in very small ways and you build on them, much like a person would build their physical body if they went to a gym. Uh, Nobody always starts out calm and rational. But I can tell you something though, that if a crisis hit, uh, wouldn't any one of us wanna be the calm and rational and uh, focused person in the room? I do, I wanna be that person. And so each time when a crisis hits, do you get up and walk out of the room? No, that's just a, that's just a rhetorical question. Uh, do you leave the problem for somebody else to solve? Because I guarantee you, if you do, you're leaving something on the table uh, where you're not going to actually learn the lesson. And some of these things are very easy lessons to learn. I've, I've had four kids and I've, I've done my best as a dad. I'm not exactly dad of the year, but uh, what I try to do is to uh, maybe give a context in which to solve a problem and uh, point them in the right direction. Uh, but but moreover, um, I don't want to tell people what the answer is. Um, uh, people need to learn. So oftentimes I would run into, uh, let's say, a student who was much younger than me and who needed to develop some leadership skills at Pepperdine and we're going through all the right classes. And I would mention, uh, hey, you know, this would be a good time for uh, someone without experience to take over as the leader of the group. You learn some great skills here. And, um, you know, we find people that are willing and some are willing, some aren't willing. Um, but if we're always going to turn away from the smallest of opportunities, uh, we never learn how to find order where there's disorder. We never learn to find the calm side of us. Uh, we, we, we don't know how to communicate when things are stressful. And those are the times when problems are smaller where we pick up those skills. So we don't walk into a chaotic room of senior people who are trying to solve COVID-19 and all of a sudden we appear as being the most rational person in the room. It doesn't happen like that. Usually it comes with age, maturity, judgment, and uh, several decades of developing those skills. And so the time to pay attention is now, and that's how you're gonna grow.
So we're not born with these skills. Um, but what you'll notice about them is that uh, for many of these things, it takes restraint and self-control. Uh, self-awareness is a big thing when you're a leader. Um, and you really need to know and understand who you are, what makes you tick. And then that way you can understand human behavior better. When you see something in yourself, you recognize it in other people. It's much like when you're driving down the road and you are driving a Toyota Corolla and you see other Toyota Corollas everywhere. Uh, these are how behaviors are identified. And so it's a great time to pay attention. Um, this also opens up intrinsic motivations. Intrinsic motivations are those things that get us up out of bed every day. Uh, you do it just because it comes out of you. It exudes from you. Uh, and then I wanted to tell you, though, if your mind, your heart, and your actions are all aligned, uh, that is what we call integrity. And the human spirit can endure and accomplish much if you have integrity. Uh, acting with integrity uh, decreases anxiety. It enhances concentration. It increases your effort and persistence at a task. It gives you a sense of satisfaction and autonomy. And uh, I can tell you after years of practicing this, I do feel those things every day. And it's a wonderful thing. But it, it came with great pain as well. Uh, because, well, I'll just describe to you some things that I went through and I'll let you be the judge. Um, so let's go on to the next, uh, the next slide here. Um, one thing that, that Charlotte mentioned earlier also um, was we don't always learn from uh, great bosses. Uh, what I mean is, is that uh, if you're a, a good boss, you always care about your people. You're always looking out for them and making sure that they have all of their satisfied needs. Um, you're, you're paving the way for them. You're giving them attention whenever they need help. Um, oftentimes, it's the absence of those things that really draw our attention uh, because it doesn't even necessarily have to be toxic, but you know when a leader does not care about you and it shows and uh, you start to guess at their motivations and, and, and which way are they going or even if you have a shot of coming on their radar uh, and then that's when your senses start going, uh, going up uh, as well as they should. Um, so this story, in part, I'm going to talk to you about these things uh, because uh, we went to Iraq and we endured some technological change, uh, which was very disruptive in the war. And we had to learn some new skills while we were over there and learn some new equipment. But also we dealt with a commander, a uh, battalion commander, who uh, lacked being calm, who lacked uh, rationality, who couldn't build trust within the unit. And uh, there was a, by the end of the deployment, there was a great feeling that uh, she would just toss you out like yesterday's trash uh, if you did something wrong. Uh, and mostly because of like the outbursts that what she had and, and things like this. Uh, so many of you can identify with this. It's not a military thing. This is a human problem. Uh, many of you are fighting your own battles. Uh, uh, you have bosses that either love you or don't, and uh, you're struggling with work, and you, you want to get through some tough situations. COVID now might be shutting your business down. You're not sure how to handle it. Um, but um, let me tell you uh, what we did. And uh, I'm going to start the story out by talking about uh, how we arrived in Kuwait in uh, 2004. And... Uh, we were preparing for a convoy. This convoy would be around 750 miles uh, from uh, Kuwait all the way through Baghdad and up to Tikrit, where Saddam Hussein uh, had a palace. Um, I had over 150 vehicles and trailers, and I was going to lead this event for our battalion. And uh, this is the time when the insurgency was picking up, and all they had to hang their hat on was these roadside bombs or IEDs or improvised explosive devices. Uh, so we got to Kuwait and we conducted convoy training and uh, we learned how to shoot from our vehicles, how to handle an ambush, how to uh, recover vehicles uh, expediently, like as if we were under fire. Um, 
And the day uh, we decided to leave, I decided that it was time to come together. And I got up on the uh, bumper of a vehicle to talk to 125 people. And I gave what I thought was a rousing speech, much like you would give if you were talking to a football team or something like that, you can imagine. But we had all of America's sons and daughters out there and they wanna hear what their leader has to say. And we were talking about how we're gonna handle ourselves and fight through the tactical problem. Uh, most soldiers had a good response to it. Uh, as soon as the speech was concluded, uh, we had just received some supplies to crossload on our vehicles, and it was a shipment of body bags. Uh, we were confronted with, the, for the first time in our lives, with the grim reality of no matter how successful that we were, that someone may go home in one of these bags. And it took the steam uh, right out of any clever words I had to say. And all I had to hang my hat on was, as a leader, the moral belief that I would be there for them if anything happened on this convoy uh, through life and death, and uh, that I would follow them all the way through. And so that's how our um, leadership journey started in Iraq. Next, for those of you that aren't uh, familiar with the military, I just titled this one Military 101. Uh, this talks about uh, going from order to chaos. And that's what war is all about. This is a spectrum of war graph. You can see on the lower axis, we have the crisis going from peacetime to war, and it heats up in a red color. And then we can see that the use of force is ratcheted up uh, as you get to full combat, unrestricted combat, and, you know, with tactical military activities. Uh, so I'm in the National Guard in the reserves, and we're responsible for conducting offensive, defensive, and stability and enabling tasks. Uh, we're also responsible for uh, conducting state emergencies while we're here stateside. And there's been times where uh, during uh, stateside here um, that we've been at our jobs and been asked to leave our jobs and go fight wildfires. And uh, then later on in the year, load a plane and go fight the counterinsurgency like as if we were active duty soldiers. And so this is the environment that I'm talking about. So from order to chaos, Ed, have your life ever felt like that? Uh, because uh, some really smart people say that life tends to go from order to chaos and back to order again. And so that's an interesting comparison. Um, I want to move on to the next slide. Um, also, I want to tell you what level of warfare we were at. So this uh, illustration just uh, will show that for you. So the president and the Joint Chiefs, uh, they conduct grand and strategic uh, strategy. They uh, work at national and multinational levels. They uh, do treaties and uh, come up with agreements. And then underneath them, there are combatant commands that are assigned regional places in the earth, like uh, North American Command, uh, South Southern Command for South America, the Southern Hemisphere, uh, European Command, that sort of thing. They come up with strategies for their own theater uh, specific, and they come up with agreements with these governments. And then there's division level, that's usually like a two-star general. And uh, they do the operational level of war. They plan major campaigns for the uh, units. And uh, this is just way levels above what I ever aspired to be. So I, we don't pay much attention at my level. Uh, at the brigade level, that's run by a colonel. And those are usually tactics uh, that are being employed because they're functional areas like aviation or infantry or military police. And they're performing tactical actions under the campaign plan. Well, where I'm at is way down there at the bottom, at the technical level with individuals and equipment. I had a group, a company of people at one point, I think it was 155 when I was in Task Force Odin. Uh, we just went out and executed a tactical aviation task and uh, execute lawful orders of those appointed over us. So that's the level of war that we were at. We're, we're, not, we're not doing anything uh, related to our national strategic level or instruments of our national power. And so uh, this is getting more into what I wanted to talk about today. So um, as we're preparing for war in 2003, uh, we got our notification and um, there was a deployment in 2004. You can see that's right when these um, IED attacks had started. So you can see the numbers on the side go up to 3000 and you can see the peak 
the peak there is at 2,500. The bottom scale starts by month in 2003, all the way through uh, 2008. And you can see that uh, the green is, the IEDs have been found and cleared. And then uh, plain old ineffective IED attacks. And then at the bottom, these are attacks uh, listed by month where it caused coalition force casualties or death. And they're listed by attacks. Uh, however, you should know that where there were casualties, there were probably also deaths. And those are listed by numbers of attack. And so sometimes maybe one person was injured. Sometimes maybe 10 or 15 people were injured or more. Um, but um, each person that was injured cost this country our national treasure uh, with a life um, and or millions of dollars. Many times there were vehicles that were very expensive to get there, very expensive to manufacture and sell to America. Uh, but also, um, if those who were hospitalized were going to undergo treatment for the rest of their lives, and there'll be millions of dollars spent on their treatment. And so these people, they gave, uh, they gave all. Uh, but in there, you can see also that there were plain old ineffective IED attacks and IED attacks found and cleared. And much of that is due to the technology, uh, technological change that were given to soldiers. Um, and thank God. And some of it was just plain old Iraq uh, and some, some of the Middle East still lives in what, the Stone Age. Uh, they started out the war uh, using timers and they would watch a convoy uh, coming down the road and they would set a bomb and set a timer and in the belief that the cars would show up at that time and then the bomb would go off and you know it would take out a couple vehicles uh, and sometimes that timer plain old didn't work because they didn't our vehicles don't follow the speed limits or they don't have any uh, a certain speed that they're trying to maintain and then uh, other times our, our people were so good that they they located the bombs, you know, they weren't buried that well. Um, and so, uh, like in many um, low intensity conflicts though, these insurgents um, were not gonna attack Americans straightforward. They were gonna use these IED attacks as their vehicle so that they wouldn't have to hang around and, and give their own life. They could also exit the area and live again for another attack on another day. So, uh, but if you're familiar with what an insurgency is, is they're trying to um, gain control of the local populace using uh, terrorist type tactics. And they're also destroying um, institutions and cultural sites around the country and religious symbols. And they're trying to uh, take out uh, the infidel Westerners that are there. Uh, it, this is the mindset there. And then America just got smart on these IEDs. And so uh, the terrorists would try to stay one step ahead of us. And uh, they would make a move, we would make a move. And in, in much of life, that's how it happens. Uh, we have to recognize when things happen and change in our world. And we have to accept that it changed. And then we have to make another move. Uh, so, um, Let's just see here. Uh, during this time also, um, I wanted to point out that we arrived in the theater in 2004 and we left in October of 2005. And so it was just about a year. Uh, there was a big group of pilots and support people. We, were, we tolerated each other at drill uh, quite a bit and we got there and, and we grew up fond of each other because that's all we had. We were family there. Uh, we had some hardworking crew chiefs that maintained the helicopters. And uh, we did a lot of different missions. Uh, we we uh, used those helicopters like they were taxi cabs. Uh, we tried to keep them off, keep the soldiers off of the roads uh, because of these IED attacks. Uh, however, though, that our commander, when she showed up there, uh, her she was very weak at self awareness. Uh, she didn't have a lot of self-regulation, so her emotions would swing wildly depending on the situation. Uh, she had a terrible, moody, mean streak as well. And if you happen to be around her, uh, she wouldn't mind leveling out some personal insults as well. Um, one thing that she relied on heavily was using fear 
as a tactic to lead. It was a tool uh, for her so that if you were afraid of her, um, you know, it was, you know, her way or the highway or it's your job, you know, or you're going to be replaced. And um, some of you may be in your job currently and have that type of boss. Uh, you should look, look down on that. Uh, what I want to point out here is those are usually habits where somebody has done that to them and they've recognized it. And then they turn around to do it on another person. And the lesson there is that if you know how it feels to do that, then shame on you if you do it to other people. Okay? The uh, fear is not a tool to lead. It's very short in duration that you can use fear. And even in times of war, I don't use fear. Um, not even when it's expedient, I don't use fear. I don't want people following me because they're afraid. I want people to follow uh, what we're saying because they love each other and we're going to stick together uh, through thick and thin, uh, not because they're afraid of me, you know, or what I'll do to them. Uh, that's, that's no way to lead. Uh, and what we found ourselves doing was we found ourselves doing these missions in combat, not fearing the enemy as much as coming back in from the day of a long mission and fearing her overreactions. And uh, we had a lot of nicknames for that, but uh, it, it happened on a daily, a daily basis. And so uh, we had to come together, but at the same time, we're dealing with a, a technology problem. So this slide is called Getting Left of Boom. And Boom, obviously, is the IED. And so we started out with some very rudimentary uh, equipment. And we had to get left side of that boom in time very quickly uh, because people were dying in these vehicles. So if you look over at number one, that is a regular Humvee, we call them. And I can assure you that those doors are not steel. They are vinyl. They're nothing more than like a windbreaker. And then if you look down to uh, number two, uh, where an IED had caused total destruction of a Humvee, uh, that's what that looks like. And uh, hey, hey, I hear somebody's audio. And anyway, a total destruction of a Humvee uh, isn't pretty. Um, it was made out of steel, but it was not made to withstand uh, those kinds of things, uh, but we had to evolve and there was a tremendous amount of political pressure on our government once our national treasure was coming home in coffins. And so uh, we evolved from that. If you go over to number three, what you see is what I call hillbilly armor. So uh, soldiers over there, uh, they found steel and uh, they cut steel using welders and they put this steel around the vehicles on doors. Now it may have stopped some small caliber weapons, but it probably wasn't going to uh, stop any 7.62 or greater, or even 50 cal caliber bullets. Uh, the steel was there probably more for moral support. It made us feel a little bit more safer, uh, but uh, they fashioned doors and I had some really uh, courageous young people who made these doors for all of our vehicles. And uh, we were grateful. Uh, but during that same time in Kuwait, uh, the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, was getting so much political pressure, he went over there to talk to leaders. And he arrived in Kuwait and he gave a press conference. And one of his famous statements, he says, we go to war with the army that we have. And we're gonna adapt and we're gonna change. But this is the army that we have and we're at war. And so we're gonna keep going. So guess what? I loaded up 125 people and I drove them north with what we had. And what we had was hillbilly armor. And I didn't have a lot of confidence in that. And uh, because of that, um, I got stuck with a very inexperienced crew. Uh, they guess they wanted their commander to uh, feel some of the pain too. So I, I rode in the vehicle that I had with high schoolers, people, kids that had no more than graduated high school 750 miles and it took us three days uh, to get through Baghdad and go north to Jakrit. And these kids uh, showed a lot of personal courage. You'd be proud of them. They're America's uh, greatest uh, youth. And I love and respect them still and contact with them today. 
Um, so next, uh, you'll see that uh, the Army developed add-on armor plating for the vehicles. Uh, this armor plating right here uh, was developed quickly and put out very quickly, and it got to us in Iraq after our convoy had already landed in Tikrit. And uh, they installed this in our vehicles. Our maintenance folks had to help them. Uh, but this was a little bit better. Uh, this, this stuff would probably stop most of the shrapnel and also uh, some of the bullets. But you can see that uh, there's a fiberglass hood there. There's uh, still a glass windshield. And there's plenty of places for a bullet to go through. So what the insurgents started doing when they saw this armor was they were attaching bombs to the underside of bridge overpasses because they knew that the top of our vehicles did not have armor and they were gonna blast down on our vehicles and that was the newest tactic. So um, our country made some more investments and later in the year, we received up armor Humvees. Uh, now these up armor Humvees, uh, they required a little bit more training and you can see that there is a turret up top where somebody can fire a machine gun and they're covered. Um, all of this uh, happens uh, near uh, the span of like four or five months when they start fielding all of this equipment. It had a stronger transmission so that it could carry all the weight of that. And uh, the next thing that came out was these uh, advanced uh, counter IED vehicles. Uh, one of them was called the Buffalo there. It's really big. And they're, they're shaped so that they will deflect the blast of a bomb. So if a bomb goes off under the tire, it may blow the tire off and it may blow off uh, the differential, but it's not gonna enter the uh, cabin area and most occupants would be safe. While um, this uh, provided uh, quite a bit of safety, also these things weighed a lot. And so what we found were that soldiers were driving them out on the levees and dikes and the dikes were collapsing and some of these vehicles were turning over and the people inside them were drowned in the water and so they had to start training soldiers to get out of these vehicles while it was underwater. And so this was the iterative effect of getting left a boom in an expedient way. And this is where our national power had used to get soldiers the tools that they needed to adjust to what was happening on the battlefield. And uh, during this time, uh, back to the personal side, uh, we are all living in tents at Fob Spiker near Tikrit. Um, it went from very cold to very hot, just like you imagine a desert would. Um, the days were long, and uh, we were doing our ring routes uh, to keep the soldiers off the road while we were living in cots and tents. And uh, the helicopter maintenance status starts to become an issue, and it becomes an intense subject around the command team because we have to keep these helicopters flying. It's uh, literally life and death. So our commander is starting to get a lot of heat for the status of our aircraft. And we are fighting the elements of the heat and we are fighting the dust and the dryness and the, uh, the dust storms there were enormous and they would cause just a complete eclipse of the sun. That's how bad it was to the point where you really couldn't even breathe. And if you got caught flying in it, um, probably not gonna be able to land the aircraft uh, too easily because you couldn't see the ground. Uh, but luckily we had radar altimeters and that at least helped guide us uh, down to the ground in those times. Um, our, our battalion commander at this time, she's starting to become infamous because of these outbursts. Uh, one time uh, there was uh, a person uh, uh, who infiltrated our base and uh, she just, kind of lost it, uh, melted down, just started yelling at people, like individuals, not really other leaders or other commanders or organizing the effort of resistance. Um, uh, one time, uh, well, many times, uh, she, she denigrated people and other leaders. Um, there, was a, there was a pilot who picked up uh, a soldier on the battlefield who had been injured by a bomb, and uh, she took away his pilot in command status because she didn't like the decision she felt like it threatened the crew and the aircraft. Um, uh, she had some clear favorites that, uh, that she liked and people that she didn't like. And uh, she just made that known by her behavior. And as, a, as we all know, um, when you pick favorites as a leader, you're choosing sides. You're saying this person's gonna win. 
Uh, there's never going to be an argument that this person's not going to win. It's not a good habit. It's a bad habit. And so I don't recommend that, but these are the routes that she went on. And so as the grime started taking its toll on us physically, uh, the resentment started building for this. And, uh, and there was clear favorites and uh, there was really in our private discussions, we began to talk about ways of containing her behavior and the effects that it has. Uh, this is where in the beginning, I talk about self-awareness. Uh, so uh, this uh, leader, she did not understand the effect that her behavior was, ha was having on her unit morale. And uh, when you're a team and you're, you're fighting against a lot of odds and including the environment, uh, temperatures usually run pretty high uh, in individuals and the environment. Uh, people that get short with each other, uh, it's the same kind of family relationship that you would have where somebody uh, moves all your stuff off the sink and you're about to use it or you go get in the shower and there's no hot water, you know. These are very personal things that happen to us overseas and so morale uh, to be low uh, is a bad thing. Uh, we need people to be team, team members over there, just much like you need your corporation to act like a team. But she obviously could not uh, tell about the effects and uh, the leaders that were right under her, the majors, uh, they were aware of the effect of her behavior on soldiers, especially the lower side, but they lacked the candor to let her know what was happening. And so the unit just kept spiraling down. Pilot, Dan, I wanted to interrupt you to let you know we've got about 15 more minutes. So I wanted okay. to just give you a time check there, okay? Okay, sure. Thank you for that, Charlotte. Um, I wanted to also explain that uh, the war still goes on. Um, and so these are the devices that we're fighting right here. The CENTCOM commander uh, started this uh, unit called Gietto. Uh, you can see what it stands for. And it had about 1,100 people there to take care of the bombs. Uh, they dismantled everything about these bombs. We collected evidence and uh, they sent it in. They used it to interrupt the supply network and find out the signatures of who, who were making, who were these bomb makers were. And uh, just so you know, bombs, they need explosive material, an ignition device, a fuse or a detonation signal like electronic or pressure. Uh, and they've been used in booby traps for, for centuries. You can see here that there's one that, that's being set off with a cell phone. There's another one that is fused with detonation cord. And that circle there in the middle, that's a pressure uh, bomb. And then off to the side there is a command detonated bomb. And that's a command wire, that, that uh, wire strip there. And so um, we were hauling around a lot of these bomb sniffing dogs and the robots and the EOD teams over Iraq. Uh, and we would find ways to come together at the end of the day, the subordinate leaders. Uh, we got together on a basketball court at night and uh, we played some basketball until we retired and then uh, we decided to talk about what was going on in the unit and make adjustments because of the things that her leadership brought about that day, uh, make adjustments to help contain her. And then uh, finally, we played a lot of pranks on each other. Uh, you know, right before bedtime, uh, sometimes I would uh, play a prank on my friend where uh, I would use a little shaving cream like this right here. And uh, if you take these uh, little bottles of shaving cream and poke a hole in it, it makes a nice little object you could throw into somebody's room. And uh, we would use that to just keep laughing. And that's one of the lessons learned though, is that even during tough times, you have to laugh. You have to find something in your life to laugh at. And sometimes that was me. I wasn't getting the war that I wanted either. Uh, one time I went into a meeting at the brigade level and we were told never be late, uh, never to be late uh, to these meetings. And um, we showed up late one day and the brigade commander was there. He's a full board colonel. He said, you guys come up to the front. And there was the only two seats left in the room. And it's a room full of my peers. And we got all of our gear on. We walk in and I sit down in the chair. And the first thing that happens, because it's like a picnic chair, the, the legs broke out from underneath it. And I fell to the ground. And the room broke out in hysterics. And all my peers were laughing. And then when the room finally calmed down and got quiet again, 
the first slide in the briefing came up and it was my slide to brief. And the room started laughing again. It erupted in complete laughter. I was embarrassed. I couldn't even brief. I stood up and said, any questions? And then I sat back down in the seat after somebody gave me a new chair. And so even when you're going through the toughest of times, you need to find something to laugh at. So this technological problem that we had uh, was overcome through these uh, countermeasures. So you can see that there are some command initiated devices over here. Uh, they were using key fobs, they were using um, <coughs> phones, uh, and they were using these other devices uh, that would give electronic signal uh, like radios. And, and then we developed these systems that our unit was outfitted with. Uh, one, you could see them there. Some of them were individual packed on your back. Some of them were mounted on vehicles and some of them were for protecting convoys. And what they were, were jammers. And so a huge curtain would follow these convoys and surround them with an electronic curtain so that when you pulled into the zone of a IED, that this jammer would protect any signals from intruding to get to that bomb and ignite it. And that's how we got left to boom. Uh, but there was a lot of training and a lot of fielding that went on for this. And they, they worked quite a bit, but they also jammed our own communications too. So if you're in a vehicle that had the warlock on it, you probably couldn't use your radio at all either. <laughs> so there were a little bit of things to overcome there. Uh, so by this time, the morale was at an absolute low. Switching back to the personal side, we're about five or six months into it the brigade had learned about our uh, morale problems and they started investigating it with the um, inspector general and the environment was raw with emotion and divided by the favoritism and she was under fire uh, for the aircraft maintenance was just dismal and she was under fire for that and she decided to make her move on her boss uh, while he was on leave so she packaged up a bunch of his emails and went to uh, his boss while he was gone. Well, when he came back, he fired her. And uh, we lived through a terrible time there under that, but we learned a lot because of the stress that we were under at the time. And if I had to grade myself during that time, I would say that uh, uh, there were things that I could have done better. And I had to live with a lot of regret during that time. But for the next five years, uh, I learned how to get better and stronger and how to uh, get my voice and find my voice in there. And those were some of the things, but you know, when she was fired, it was like uh, the Lord of the Flies, you know, the pressure had been relieved. And for a couple of days, all we did was do our mission and let it be eerily, you know. And we went home four months later from that terrible experience, uh, but the war went on. I wanna to talk to you about uh, the next step in the doctrine, persistent stare. So we learned that if we can uh, stare, uh, it said I was muted there, Sharla. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, um, I was actually trying to mute myself. I just wanted to give you another time check because we have about 10 more minutes. Okay. <laughs> so you'll have to move along. Uh, persistent stare is about conducting surveillance. We learned that if we were doing full motion video, that that was just like looking through a soda straw. And so uh, contractors developed this thing of looking at many targets at once. And uh, it was basically to establish a pattern of life on our enemies and detect changes forensically. So also during this time, um, we had ground penetrating radar where we can discover where somebody had buried a bomb. So they just go back and they film the roads and they look for changes and they can tell where there's a bomb setting. Uh, as well as uh, when you look at something from radar from the side, you can tell if there's a command wire lane across the road. And so uh, we began to find bombs before they can set them off. And that's what really changed. Uh, so five years later, I would go back in 2010 and deploy again. And this is the unit that I deployed with. Uh, Task Force Odin, it means uh, observe, detect, identify, and neutralize. So we would use these planes and the UAVs to find bombs. And we would hunt bombs down on the roads and wherever they were trying to set them off. And then we would get them neutralized. Oftentimes there would be insurgents uh, still around and uh, they would be neutralized and we'd pick up electronics from them and we would move to the next target immediately. And that, that can be described as kinetic, uh, kinetic attacks. And these things happen 24 seven and 365 days out of the year. 
And I was the unit commander for these uh, aircraft fleet that you see here. Uh, I mean, I have a few guys that were there from the inception. It was tremendously successful. But this uh, unit, um, <laughs> I'm going to figure someone's going to ask me for my password uh, right when I'm in the middle of talking. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I wanted to explain that when I Well, I think Dan has unfortunately um, frozen for a minute. Um, so there's a couple of questions that are on the chat that um, I thought would be There you are, Dan. You froze for a second. So I thought I would take the opportunity to ask a couple of questions that have come up on the chat. And okay. then I thought maybe we could kind of move towards the end and, uh, and pull out some of the lessons that we have. Um, the first one was from a student who asked, um, you know, how can we step back to ensure that we're leading our troops? And then the second question is about, you know, who has had a major impact on your leadership? Um, and then maybe we'll ask a few more later. Uh, stepping back, that is something that uh, you really need to understand who you are. I'm going to take it back to that because um, understanding human motivation, uh, what drives you, what may drive other people, uh, and uh, what your organization needs to accomplish. Oftentimes, I take inventory in my mind of what are my assets, um, who are the people that I can count on the most? And what do I think I can get done? Because everything is just not a priority. There are priorities and then there are some things that are just nagging you, but everything is not the priority. Uh, some of the people I look up most are actually just people that I grew up with that I respect. And when I saw them walk through hardness and then the way they handled themselves, um, Mark Van Dyke, he's a really good example of a leader to me who is just a wonderful person, a great human being. And in times of stress, you can always count on him remaining calm and rational. And I look up to him. So yeah, I'll, I'll move it along here. So the only thing constant is change. I was gonna just show you guys that this is what our nation depends on, uh, DARPA to come up with all of our national research and DITRA, uh, Defense Threat Reduction Agency. They have some wonderful things that they make for our military and they keep other countries honest. Uh, this is the aircraft that I fly. Um, they're going to use this open architecture to add, just like you add an app to your phone, they're going to add software in our aircraft now. And so that's what we're hoping for. It's a brighter future for us all. Um, drones are the latest thing, <coughs> protecting our troops from drones. And then uh, lastly, uh, it looks like we may be losing some uh, dominance in the electromagnetic fields. Uh, China and Russia are making some... Uh, some headway in this area and we have to get ahead of that and so there's some of the things our nation faces so with that i just want to point out some axioms here we need people not technology that's pretty obvious but sometimes we have leaders that are just naturally techies and they want to talk about technology all day uh, there's a human side of leadership and i just say stay close to that because if your people lose morale then uh you're gonna be sitting there all by yourself leading nobody. Um, whenever there's change, and there's always constant change uh, because the pace of innovation, uh, you need to increase communication, increase the pace and frequency of your communication. And whenever there's change, uh, anticipate that some just don't wanna go along with it. Uh, it's a natural reaction. And sometimes you have to let it surface so that you can see what the objections are, and then that you can address that and assuage fears because oftentimes people don't want to change just out of the fear of it. Like sometimes they'll get voted off the island. Uh, the market and the enemy gets a vote. So I'm here to say that you need to accept the world as it is, not as you want it to be. And the sooner you do that, you can get on to solving the problem. Um, like I said before, everything is just not a priority. And that was one of the things that uh, this commander faced is that she, she tr talked about everything and the frequency and tone as everything was a priority all at once. And you can only get a few things done when you're a leader sometimes. Um, abandoned tribal knowledge. Sometimes uh, assumptions that we have are built over time and years, and they're just not relevant anymore. And you have to challenge those beliefs. Uh, change is incremental and iterative. 
Um, celebrate small wins, but also if people are changing, celebrate that too. Uh, but just take time to recognize it. And don't ask for people to change overnight. We're all human, right? We can only make so much change and stay rational. Um, one thing about it is organizational enthusiasm will deplete right before success. So right as you're about to crest that mountain, uh, the bottom will drop out and you're going to have to rescue it. Just count on that. Um, uplifting others is always a better way to be. It's just a better way to be as a human being. And you're going to get more uh, out of it from your people. People will trust you more and they'll also believe in you because they know that you recognize their talent and the good that's in them. Um, and then finally, <clears throat> when, when temperatures get high, when people's angst get built up, it takes personal courage uh, to confront things. And it took me a while. It took uh, a lot of that, that first deployment that I had. Well, in the second deployment, I confronted another leader that was being toxic. And it took a lot of personal courage and I had to find my voice. And I had to articulate that there's a difference between um, following my country and then following the personal uh, desires and the whimsical desires of a leader. And I had to explain where he was getting off track. He didn't buy it. He still tried to, uh, you know, take us out of a job, but it didn't stop me. And I can tell you, I felt all the calmness and all the cool and collectedness when I was doing that with him as I ever felt. And I felt the autonomy that I needed to feel. And, and that's because I spent that interwar period of time working on myself and building up my character and deciding not to run from adversity. And so you can do this too. Um, and that's, that's really the main point of my talk tonight. I hope you um, got something out of it. Are there any more questions, Charlotte? Yeah, there's a couple more. And actually, if you could go back to the last slide, because that's really where we're at in terms of resilience and leadership during a crisis. And we're able to get to this, to this very powerful story of how things uh, evolved in Iraq. And um, I, I, I know I having spoken to you that there was not only this one kind of toxic leader, but following on that, there was another commander who was sort of toxic and you, you learned so many lessons. I think it's, um, uh, it's fantastic to kind of pull it together here. One of the questions, um, there's one that you answered related to the electronic battlefield. So you were a little ahead of us. Um, Black Swan events, you mentioned that. And uh, there was a question about, you know, the, the new book that was out about Black Swan events, but um, there was another question related to, um, you know, uh, at how that impacts your leadership or do these axioms remain constant? Well, I, I want to, the definition of an axiom is something that remains constant, but I want to explain to you that I don't get the war that I want. Many times, uh, like I showed up to my new unit, it has 450 soldiers, and the month after that I took over this brand new shiny car, uh, a beautiful, wonderful unit, uh, we take a survey and I find out that there are people in my formation that have suicidal ideation. Mm. And the unit has been under tremendous stress for quite a long time and that there is likely an event to occur uh, soon if it's not addressed. <clears throat> I did not know anything about suicide at that time, uh, but I decided that it, it's not going to happen on my watch. We're not doing this. And I decided to get smart on this uh, real quick. And um, it led me down a path of just being a better human being, uh, but addressing and assuaging people's fears and the circumstances that we're serving under, and that these people couldn't readily be identified. So I had to treat the entire formation as if, as if it could be any one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we can do when there's a threat within our organization is we can talk about the stigma of the, of the suicide and we can talk about suicide uh, in order to lower the stigma to make sure that people understand that they're approachable for this idea. In fact, the more you talk about it, the less the stigma happens. And it's a phenomenon that not, none of our experts have solved. It, it is uh, complex in nature because there are several reasons why people do it. And after they gone from this world, uh, you can't tell why they did it unless they left some a note or recording. And so um, it's much like a, a complex uh, black swan event. And so we're still addressing it. And from that day forward, uh, we have a 
be more human command. Uh, because of the circumstances that I've lived through, uh, my leadership has changed over the years. Uh, one of the first things I told him was, I trust you. I trust your judgment. I trust that you're doing what you're trained to be doing. And uh, I got rid of this idea that we're watching our, our clocks and as well as I uh, changed some of the rules, even though I wasn't supposed to, I let people bring their dogs to work. We have dogs running around in our workplace. Uh, we let people telework, work from home. We, we adjust to their circumstances quite a bit. Uh, we demand a lot out of these people. So the leadership style that's appropriate is to let them do the things they need to run their life too and make sure their life is good. And so that we don't have such a uh, situation where people are feeling like nobody cares about them. Excellent. Uh, sake, uh, this is one thing that I want people to know who, who are working for me is that I love them and care about them dearly. And we've met several times and had uh, listening sessions about this topic. And so we're adjusting our leadership as we go, much like what we described about the IEDs. Uh, this is just as much a threat to our formation as any one of those Absolutely. IEDs. Absolutely. I live with myself if somebody took their life in their formation. Absolutely. Any so, um, I, uh, well, we've run out. Uh, we've run out of time. Um, there was a question. We'll end with this, and then I want to thank you uh, for all that you've provided for us. Not only the story where we were able to travel along with you in Iraq, but these lessons on leadership. Um, uh, and the question is about tribal knowledge, and you mentioned abandoning tribal knowledge. Could you elaborate on that a little bit more, and, uh, and then we'll close out this session. The idea of tribal knowledge is like, well, hey, we've always done it this way. Uh, well, hey, circumstances have changed, and we're asking you not to do it this way anymore. Or, or the certain assumptions that uh, some support relationship was always going to be there for you. And then when you need it, it's not. And that's usually when people get angry. Uh, what we're saying is if circumstances uh, don't permit for the historical tribal knowledge in your corporation or your company or the army or wherever you're at, then you have to abandon that assumption and you have to move forward as if it doesn't exist anymore and change and evolve. Don't get stuck in the past when things change. It's a very important part of this whole thing because uh, people who are stagnant in their learning, people who do not adapt, they get left behind. Mm -hmm. And technology leaves them behind, and so do uh, standard practices. And so if you refuse to adjust to the world, you're gonna find yourself a very angry person when everybody else left. <laughs> Got it. So, um, yeah, and I, actually, I think I misread. The question was about this tribal knowledge that you just explained. And also, as you mentioned, you know, these are documented tacit knowledge that's, that exists. Um, and uh, I want to just spend a few moments thanking you, Lieutenant Colonel um, Dan Carlson, for your service to our country, for, um, at, for sharing with us your experience and your knowledge, and uh, for, for giving us your time. Um, there's just so much to, to continue to talk about, and, uh, and yet I want to respect everybody's time, and I want to respect your time, and I want to give you our deepest gratitude uh, for helping us learn some lessons that we can apply in this situation. And we will be um, uh, providing this for people to take a look at so that we can go back to those axioms that we can apply. So thank you so much, Dan. It's, it's an honor and a privilege to, to learn from you. And thank you so much for joining us. Music